Hi, welcome back. This is Professor Schimmeld with uh, the beginning of our discussion of the viruses. This is a pretty long section, you guys, so it's going to take several segments to cover everything that we, we need to discuss. With this um, first installment, I want to just go ahead and give you um, kind of an overview of viruses and um, talk about some of their general characteristics, and then uh, we'll we'll get into different categories of viral infections and then we'll do surveys of some RNA viruses and some DNA viruses. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, how do you define a virus? Well, uh, a virus is um, an infectious agent that uh, is um, sub-microscopic, meaning too small to be seen with a light microscope. That's the type of microscope that we use in our laboratories. Um, it contains a nucleic acid molecule, either DNA or RNA, never both. I'll, I'll repeat that a little later in this lecture. Um, this uh, uh, nucleic acid molecule is usually, if not always, surrounded by a protein coating called a capsid, and the capsid may in turn be surrounded by other layers, for example, an envelope. And we'll talk more about that when we uh, take a look at some different types of viral morphology. Uh, now, the viruses are referred to as being acellular, meaning um, without cells. If you put A or AN in front of a word, it means no or not or without. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as being subcellular, meaning below the level of the cell because viruses are generally smaller and simpler than even the most basic cell, which would be a bacterium. Um, all right, so you're following along on your outline, and under Roman numeral number two, I want to talk about uh, what are known as the prions or prions. Either pronunciation is correct. And these are not viruses, but because they are of the um, of similar size to viruses, sub-microscopic, it's just kind of convenient to discuss them at the same time. Now, the prions are infectious proteins no nucleic acid whatsoever. Uh, they are proteins that are, um, usually they use the term misfolded, meaning. Now, I'm sure you'll recall that proteins have a very specific three-dimensional shape. So we have um, a, um, a string of amino acid, um, of amino acids uh, strung together in a particular order, and then we'll see folding and bending and twisting and bonding on different levels until that protein uh, achieves a very specific three-dimensional shape. That three-dimensional shape is necessary to be maintained for the function of the protein. Well, prions are misfolded proteins, and what's interesting about them is when they come into contact with normal proteins, they cause those normal proteins to misfold just like the prion. Uh, this is usually happening in the, uh, the brain of the infected individual, and it will, uh, over time, although it could take quite a bit of time, have a, um, a fatal result. All right, what else do I want to tell you? Let's go on to Roman numeral number three. Are viruses alive? Well, that's a good question, and uh, I guess it depends on how do you define life? Uh, when I think of living things, uh, I, I think of some of their characteristics, including, for example, um, uh, living things um, uh, metabolize, and they respire, and they reproduce, um, and they, uh, many of them, not all, but they respond to a stimulus, meaning if you, you know, like poke it with a stick, it's going to say, um, ouch, or uh, or stop it, or um, reach around and smack you. Um, th that's what I mean by responding to a stimulus. Well, okay, viruses. Do they possess any of those characteristics? Well, viruses don't respire, and they, they don't, by strict definition of the word, metabolize. Uh, they do reproduce, but they have to actually uh, infect a host cell, cause some changes in the host cell's reproductive machinery, and, and turn the host cell into a, a, a virus factory. Okay, so viruses can reproduce, but not without a lot of help. And viruses certainly don't respond to a stimulus, so I guess you can go ahead and poke them with a stick and you'll be okay. Uh, so we either need to um, redefine what is life to us, uh, what does life mean? How do we want to define life? Um, because some people argue that viruses are alive. They're just simpler than the life forms that we are accustomed to. Other people 
argue that because viruses can't do many of those um, and others characteristics that I just discussed that we um, associate with living things, that really they're not alive. I think you could make a good argument on either side of that uh, particular topic. All right, so I'm still in Roman, Roman numeral number three. Uh, some basic facts about viruses, and this should be in your outline, and it is. By the way, can you see the fish? I, uh, I got some um, of those uh, beta fish, and um, I've got a male in a, in a container in another part of my house, and I felt kind of bad for him being alone, so I bought a female fish and, and put that um, in there with him. And I'd read that, I mean, you can't put two males together because they do fight, um, but that, you know, most males would tolerate a female. He picked on her pretty bad, so anyways, I gave her her own uh, container and then I bought her a companion, so she's got, um, um, uh, her best gal friend is in there with her, so I don't know if you can see him swimming around or not, but there's a red one and a blue one and they're awfully pretty. Okay, so I'm still talking about um, viruses. I'm uh, in Roman numeral three, the second bullet point. Uh, some of these things I've talked about already, but they do bear repeating. Viruses are inert outside of the host cell that they infect, meaning they're not active. Uh, they are only active when inside of their host cell. Uh, viruses evolve. That's, that's a characteristic that I associate with life. Um, and viruses do evolve, and we'll talk about that when we get a little further into this section. Um, all right, so other general characteristics of viruses, I'm in Roman numeral number four in your outline now. Uh, viruses are ubiquitous, meaning they are everywhere in our environment, and all organisms suffer their attacks. Uh, there are viruses that can infect bacteria, um, they're called the phages, or the bacteriophages. Um, there are viruses that can infect plants, animals, etc. Uh, and um, as a general characteristic, viruses are species specific, meaning most viruses, and there are definitely large uh, and significant exceptions to this, but most viruses can only infect one species of organism. Uh, and the more closely related the organisms are, the more likely it is that a virus can jump from one species to another. Let me give you an example. Um, all right, a virus that could infect a plant, it is extremely unlikely that it could ever mutate to the point where it could infect humans. However, a virus that could infect um, other primates like chimpanzees, for exa uh, example, not a big jump for that type of virus to uh, mutate, to evolve enough to be able to infect humans. And, and there are some examples of that. All right, I'm still talking general characteristics. Uh, most viruses are RNA viruses. There are some DNA viruses, though. Uh, range in size from anywhere from 20 nanometers up to about 1,000 nanometers. Now, you need to update your notes. I have in your notes that uh, the maximum size is about 400. I've done some reading recently that suggests that they can be quite a bit larger than that. So 20 to 400 nanometers in length. One nanometer equals one one billionth of a meter. So um, hopefully that gives you some perspective as to their size. I've mentioned this before, but viruses will contain either DNA or RNA, never both. Uh, now the viral genome, what does genome mean? The word genome refers to all of the genetic information contained in an organism. Well, anyways, the viral genome is very small. Ultimate parasites, uh, pretty much anything that the virus needs with the exception of a couple of enzymes that its host cell has no use for, like reverse transcriptase, for example, um, the virus will obtain from its host. So the viral genome is very small. All right, classification of the viruses. Oh boy, I want to talk about uh, a topic that is definitely in flux and um, many differing opinions as to how the viruses should be classified. But here are some of the criteria that we will look at, and you've got some, uh, you've got the bullet points here. You can add to that as you need to in your notes. Uh, classification of viruses, it's going to be based on several criteria. One would be its morphology, and we'll look at some examples in a few minutes. Uh, second would be its nucleic acid type, DNA or RNA. Um, Another uh, uh, factor that we'd look at when classifying viruses would be what type of host cell does it infect, plant, animal, bacterium. 
Um, another um, thing that we would look at for classification purposes would be its mode of replication. And we'll take a look at a couple of types of viral reproduction in a, in a different video. And um, we would also look at the presence or the absence of a, um, uh, a barrier that is found on many viruses called an envelope. Okay, so some viruses, for example, HIV, will see um, two strands of the nucleic acid RNA in the core of HIV, and then we'll see a protein capsid surrounding that core, and then an envelope, which is actually a tiny little chunk of the host cell's cell membrane surrounding uh, that capsid, and then um, spikes as well, that, uh, which aid in the infection process, but more on that later. Okay, uh, let's take a look at, we've got some definitions that you guys are responsible. The term um, virion, that refers to um, a complete, fully assembled, capable of causing infection viruses, meaning that uh, the reproductive phase has been completed successfully and all of the parts have been assembled correctly and now we have uh, a new virus capable of causing um, an infection if it, it comes into contact with the appropriate type of host cell. Um, a virioid, that is a virus that infects plants. Um, prion, we've already defined that one. It is an infectious agent made up of protein only, misfolded proteins, no nucleic acid. Oh, um, interesting thing about the, uh, the prions is that um, they cause some uh, diseases that have extremely long incubation periods. And we're going to talk about some of these um, in my lectures uh, that you're watching on YouTube and in class too as well. Uh, cause uh, The prions cause... Um, a type of infection known as a um, slow, they call them slow viral infections, but why don't we just call them slow infections, okay, because they're really not viruses, they're prions. Um, one that I be, will be talking about um, actually in the next segment is a disease called Kuru, or um, sometimes it's called the laughing disease, and I'll save that one for later. Um, also, prions, as we become more and more aware of them um, uh, in our um, um, in our bodies and um, uh, in other species of animals, um, we are finding that there are prions that have been implicated in a number of significant diseases. For example, Alzheimer's disease. There is some evidence to suggest that being infected with a, a particular type of prion could be one of, anyways, the causes of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, more on that later. All right, I'm continuing with the definitions. Um, lysogeny, that refers to um, uh, viruses that incorporate their nucleic acid into that of their host cell. And what we refer to as being the lytic cycle is going to be suppressed, at least for um, some period of time, could be months, could be indefinitely. Lytic cycle meaning the part of the life cycle where the virus actually starts to make copies of itself. And as those copies are um, um, completely assembled, released from the host cell, often um, is going to cause lysis, lytic cycle, of the host cell and its, uh, and its death as well. All right, a prophage. Now, um, here, guys, there's a little error in your notes, so make this change. Uh, spell check doesn't catch this type, uh, type of stuff, right? Um, under prophage, the definition for pro prophage, it says a virus is referred to as a prophage when its nucleic acid is incorporated into the host's DNA. Small but significant change here. Uh, it's the host cell that we refer, refer to as a, a prophage or a provirus when it's been infected with that virus. Right, um, uh, lysogenic cells, another name for infected host cells. Now, once a particular variety of viruses infected a, a host cell, that host cell is immune to reinfection with the same type of virus. It may, however, be susceptible to infection by uh, a different type of virus. All right, now, um, still talking about lysogenic cells, this is really fascinating. This has been observed, um, there, there are many examples of this. Uh, sometimes when host cells are infected with a virus, for example, um, let's say a bacteriophage, has infected the bacterium named Carini bacterium diphtheriae. 
causes a disease we'll talk about later this semester called diphtheria. It's a respiratory infection. Now, when the virus infects that bacterium, the virus has delivered some new genetic information to the bacterium, including instructions uh, teaching the bacterium how to produce a toxin. And it's the toxin that the bacterium can produce now that actually causes the symptoms of the disease diphtheria. Pretty interesting. Uh, we'll talk more about it later. All right, and induction. That refers to an event uh, could be exposure to a chemical, exposure to UV light, could be something else that maybe we don't clearly understand yet, but it is an event that triggers an infected host cell to uh, change from the lysogenic cycle into the lytic cycle. Okay, let me know in class if you guys have questions on, um, on any of those uh, definitions. All right, I'm going to keep going a little bit longer here. Uh, let's take a look at some examples of viral morphology, and you've got these in your outline as well. And you guys, I'm just giving you a few examples here. There are many other examples of viral morphology. Uh, but first of all is what we call a naked virus. So what we have in this situation is uh, a virus with a nucleic acid core, DNA or, or RNA, and that core is surrounded with one of those protein capsids. No envelope is present in this situation. An enveloped virus looks uh, essentially like a naked virus, but we've got that extra coating called the envelope surrounding it. There may or there may not be spikes that protrude from the envelope, um, and when those spikes are present, they assist in the infection process. Now, a complex virus, this is what the bacteriophages look like. I think this one's pretty interesting. Uh, take a look here. We've got um, um, a, a very... Um, uh, modified and, and very specific shape, quite effective in uh, infecting bacterial cells. So the nucleic acid is in that portion labeled the capsid or the head, um, and um, th these happen to be DNA viruses. Then we have um, a, a elongated area called the sheath, and when I talk about reproduction of the bacteriophages, I'll, I'll explain what the function of all of these parts is. Uh, we also have tail fibers. They do uh, come into contact with the cell wall of the host cell and um, kind of anchor the uh, bacteriophage in place. And then the pins, and um, again, I'll come back and I'll talk about that in the probably in the next segment. One more example of viral morphology is a helical virus, and you can see um, that we've got um, our nucleic acid core is kind of spiraled, and then we have a spiral-shaped capsid that is uh, uh, forming a protective um, layer around that nucleic acid, and Ebola virus is an example of um, a helical virus. Okay, I'm going to call it good for now. When I come back in segment two, um, I will talk about two examples of viral replication. We'll talk about replication of what we call the uh, T-even phages. Those are bacteriophages that infect different strains of the bacterium E. coli. And we'll also take a look at the life cycle of the human immunodeficiency virus. All right, you guys, as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.